Jason, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Tom. So this is a band record. Mm-hmm. The last two records have been just your name, mm-hmm. but this new record's Jason Isbell in the 400 unit. Why? Well, we, we uh, that's, that's usually e- either that's the first question or why did you call it the Nashville Sound is the first One or the other. I've got a, I've got a bet with myself on which one of those two <laughs> questions I'll get first. How, um, much, how much do you owe me? Uh, I don't so think, someone called me on the way here and they said, know. ask them that. And I'm give sure me. I owe you some taxes, <laughs> honestly. Um, it's an interesting question because I think of you, I mean, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm a big fan of your music and I have known, I, I came into your music on, uh, about two records ago mm-hmm. and I knew you as a singer-songwriter. Yeah. And I was so surprised to see the band. And then I found out that it's the same band. In reality, I am the former guitarist of the Drive-By Truckers. Of course. That's, <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. That's not... <laughs> I thought you were reminding me. No, I mean, I really am. But uh, most of the time, that's what they say about me, rather than singer-songwriter. Is that so? Until, until like, six months ago. Until this record. Now now there's a different first, first sentence, usually. But, um, you know, we got, like, a couple weeks into the recording, and... and it just occurred to me that it just wouldn't be the same album at all without these particular players. So I thought, I'll give them some credit for it. You know, I've, I've used them in the past on pretty much everything that I've done. Um, Southeastern, we had some subs in and out and things uh, because of scheduling issues. We sort of had to throw that record together pretty quickly. But mm-hmm. um, on something more than free and, and this album, I use the same band. And, and I've toured with these guys for a long time. And... and uh, so yeah, it just felt like the the, the content of, of the songs and the uh, performances that were on the album, uh, you know, benefited from having these particular players. So but did they mind in the past? Did they mind that they weren't getting I credited? I didn't ask. No? They never brought it up to you? Um, if they did, I didn't pay any attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the 400 unit and the 400 unit. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we talked about it in the past and they were, they were very cool with it, you know. Um, they just want to serve the songs, I think. Uh, you know, they're, they're happy. They seem to be happy. Um, and like, like I said, on Southeastern, it, it was not the full band. Sadler wasn't in the band yet. Jimbo wasn't on that record. So it was uh, a, a kind of me and Dave Cobb in the studio and my wife Amanda and we were playing parts and calling people in. You know, we didn't go in and cut live as a band mm-hmm. in the studio. Mm-hmm. And then the next couple records we did. And I really felt like Something More Than Free was a continuation of Southeastern in a lot of ways. Um, and I don't think this record necessarily was. So, you know, fresh start. Um, but, I mean, when you when you decide to give somebody credit for something, you don't really look back and think, have I given them enough credit before? Okay, but no, yeah. but sometimes you decide to give people credit because you start feeling guilty about not giving enough credit before. I'm not saying yeah. that, that that's what you did. No, no, I just thought these guys really deserved it. To, to have their name on the record. I want to talk to you about a, a line in the song, and I'm not going to ask you what it means, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the song, Something to Love, you sing, I grew up with all my family around. We made music on the porch on Sunday nights. Old men and old guitars smoking Winston lights. Old women harmonizing with the wind. One of the mistakes that people sometimes ask you is they ask you autobiograph- bi- autobiographical questions yeah. about your songs, and you write about characters sometimes, and you write about yourself sometimes. Mm-hmm. But I do know that you grew up playing music socially. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something we don't talk about enough when we talk about music, the importance of not playing professionally. Oh, right, yeah. Your, your family played? You had fam- bluegrass music in your house? Yeah, and gospel music. And, uh, yeah, and that most of the stuff in that song is is autobiographical. You know? how, does, how does the fact that you played music socially, gospel music, bluegrass music, around the house in a non-professional environment change how you approach music as opposed to others? Well, you know, I'm not sure how anybody else approaches it. Really, not at the heart, but for me, it's it's something that I do when I don't have to do anything else. So I never thought I have to practice today, and I never uh, took lessons. You know, mm. um, I never sat down and 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 uh, you know instructed myself to to practice the guitar. I've had to do it as a writer, as a songwriter. I've had to force myself to write until I got something finished. But um, really, playing music was just what I did when I wasn't being forced to do anything else. Um, and uh, I always considered it, uh, you know, something I did for enjoyment and for catharsis and, and just to find my own personal peace first and foremost. And the fact that I was able to uh, make a career out of it didn't really occur to me until a few years after I'd started playing with my family. As, do you still want to play for fun? I mean, you, mm-hmm. you, your wife, Amanda Shires, is an incredible songwriter as well. She's opening for you on this tour, and I, and I loved her most recent record. Oh, good. An, an awful lot. When you guys are around the house, are you able to play? Are you able to turn off the professional brain? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we still do a lot of that. Yeah. Um, Why is that important? It's, it's fun. You know, we just we enjoy it. And uh, 
I think that's what talent is uh, in a lot of ways. It's it's that if if you're if you're given the gift of enjoying something enough to never bore with it, never get tired of doing it, then you'll probably get pretty good at it one day. You know, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I mean that's that's I what got, it was I just got the me. shivers. Oh, good, I, good. Um, I mean it because because I think people try so hard sometimes. And listen, there's no discounting hard work. You got to yeah. work hard on things. Yeah. But I think that, you know, ultimately, my, my father always told me, he's gone now, but my father told me that if I found what I'd like to do, I'd never have to go to work. It's the truth. It yeah. really is. And it doesn't matter what it is. That's the thing. I mean, a lot of people discourage socially, you know, certain jobs or certain trades. Um, but really, there, there are people out there who are, who are really, really, really good at cleaning swimming pools. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you there's at least one guy or girl out there that loves to clean a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. It just does something for their brain. It sorts out some issue for them. Mm -hmm. And they've gotten so good at it because they just really love to do it. And they probably went around the neighborhood and cleaned people's swimming pools when they weren't home, <laughs> you know, just snuck in and cleaned them. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're doing. That's the thing. You can, you can always be... Uh, fulfilled, you know, as some people like to make shoes, some people like to make clothes, or, or some people like to build buildings, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't matter. But when it's music, it looks like magic, you know. It's one of those things that if you can't do it, you can't really fathom how it's done, mm -hmm. you know. And, and there's a lot of things like that for me, but music's not one of them. Music, I, I understand the, the fundamentals of it at the very least. And I, feel, I feel that way about songwriting. I mean, I play mm -hmm. mainly instrumental music, and I, most of my life I've played Irish music and played yeah. folk songs. Songwriting something like that, I can't quite fathom this. this I can sit down and practice, practice the guitar. Yeah. I can sit down and, and learn a reel. You know, I can sit down and learn a tune. Yeah. But the idea of sitting down and creating what you do, I, I, I don't, I don't know where to start. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like baking a loaf of bread for me. Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably two different schools uh, of creativity, and and more specifically, songwriting. You know, you have your your painters and you have your sculptors, and uh, some people sit down with a blank canvas and mm -hmm. and start adding things until they have enough. And then pe pe some people sit down with, with a big old, you know, um, a ball of clay and start sculpting until they have what they need and no more. What are, you, what are you? I think I'm the latter. I think I am because I have a tendency to uh, um, over embellish, you know. But I realized that a long time ago. So most of my editing is is cutting things away, whether it be in a song or or in a guitar part or, or in the studio working on a production or something like that. It's it's um, usually I start with a whole lot of ideas and I have to figure out which ones are good and which ones are necessary. And, and usually it's kind of like, you know how they used to say, take, uh, uh, um, one piece of jewelry off before you leave the house. I used to say that to ladies. I don't know that. You no. know, that was, that was sort of an adage back in the fifties. Take one, you know, put all, get your dress on, put your jewelry on, then take one piece off before you leave the house. Oh, like edit your... You're, you're what you're wearing. Yeah, so yeah. You, yeah what you think looks good is yeah. just one piece too much. Yeah, um, that's kind of how I am with a song. I, I, I usually, you know, if I take away one thing more than what I feel like I need to take away, it, it works out pretty well. And part of that taking away is done by your wife, Amanda. Yeah. And I, I was so surprised by this, that she, she'll, she'll edit your songs. Yes, she will, or, or at least help me edit the songs. Um, and I do that for her, too, and, and it's... Uh, Mostly what she does is ask things like, are you sure that's what you want to say? Or do you feel like this line needs to be here? You know, Is that hard because your songs, I mean, again, some of the songs are about characters. Mm -hmm. Some of the songs are about your own battles with substance abuse. Some of your songs are about your own mental uh, issues with, you know, with anxiety. Some of your songs are about her. Mm -hmm. Is it hard when you're really emoting and, and t saying something from the deepest part of you to have someone go, hey, are you sure about that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's real hard the first time. You know, and then the second time it's a little less, and the third time it's a little less, and eventually uh, you can live with it. What, what, well, what makes it worth it? Well, you get better songs, you know. Wow. Um, yeah, and that, that's worth just about anything to me as far as work goes, you know. But it's hard to do. I mean, most people, if they have any kind of success, they push away everybody who tells them that what they're doing is not genius, you know, most of the time, if you're writing songs and your songs are halfway decent, there's going to be a, a a group of people who who gravitate toward you and tell you, okay, because you're doing this, it's brilliant, and uh, they'll keep that up as long as you'll keep them around and and keep buying them drinks. You know, and and usually by a decade into your successful run, you don't have anybody around you who will say, 
this is not great. You can do better. And when that happens, you just become this caricature of yourself, and you're writing, you know, your your own best impersonation of what what you used to be. And I I want to avoid that at all costs. I think the best way to do that is, you know, grow up and take the criticism from somebody. You don't have to take it from everybody. If my wife says a song is good, I don't give a shit what Pitchfork says about it <laughs> because I know her tastes. <laughs> I know what she likes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, after after she's helped me with something and, and we finished it, then uh, nobody else can hurt me. Nobody else can say anything about the song that's going to bother me at all because I know it's done. That's so interesting because some people, like it, it's almost like there's a duality here. On one side of things, you you recognize that there's not much better than a really good song. Mm-hmm. Like that's re- extremely meaningful to you. And then also you have enough, you treat it enough like work in some ways mm-hmm. to know that work requires other people to help you out. Right. It it is it is work though it's 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 What's definitely your job? yeah it's my job but it's also not just uh, you know my not my job is not not periodically winning the lottery mm-hmm. you know I I have to approach David Hood told me a long long time ago um, David was the bass player in the Muscle Shoals rhythm section of Swampers um, and his and son uh, his son Patterson started the, the drive by truckers, truckers that yeah. I was in but um, I've been real close with David for many, many years. Very, very lucky to grow up around him and, and his contemporaries in Muscle Shoals. And, and he, he told me a long time ago, you have to treat this like you would any other career. You have to have gear that works. You have to show up on time. You've got to be respectful and you've got to work hard. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, no matter how much magic there is when, when somebody hears a finished product on a record, it's going to take some work. You know, the magician practices sawing the lady in half. And, you know, he knows what he's doing. If, if everybody else knows what you're doing, then you're doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. You know? So when someone shows up drunk or, or late now at a, at a gig that you're at, obviously not in your band, but if you're yeah. around, do you have nothing but contempt for that because you have that hard work in, in, in instilled in you? Well, I mean, if they're not in my band, I don't care. Really? You know, unless they're affecting our schedule of, uh, on the day, but nobody does that anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody does that to me now. Uh, I think everybody realizes that that's not okay. I, I think I I'm, I'm more asking, to. like, if you, if you saw it happen, seeing as how you went through something similar, oh, uh, similar yeah. in the drive-by truckers, and this wasn't even what I was going to get at, right? but when you see that happen, is there a part of you that goes, oh, they'll learn? It depends. I mean, those situations are very, very different. You know, most people won't learn. Most people won't learn. Most, most people will fail at, at, at trying to make it in the music business. Most mm-hmm. people will fail at trying to get sober and stay sober. You know, if you don't understand the the, the size of your enemy, there's absolutely no way you're going to beat him. Mo- most people, yeah, if they try to get sober, then it's not going to work. Sorry, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and most people who try to make a living by singing songs, you're screwed. It's not a good idea. The numbers are not there for you. Um, but if you're willing to do whatever it takes, you can really increase those odds a whole lot, a whole lot. And that, that works with sobriety or with success in the music business or, you know, creative success or anything else. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with Jason Isbell, and it's a really interesting time to be speaking to you. Your song, White Man's World, is coming up an awful lot, and I feel like it couldn't be more timely. I mean, it probably mm-hmm. could have come out whenever, but yeah. it's, it's incredibly timely right now. I mean, an honest look at oftentimes the racism and prejudice committed by white men, the environment that your young daughter is going to be growing up in, the environment that your wife is a, as a career musician has found herself in, and, and the quest and the battered hope that you have to try and carve out. I mean, you turn on the news, and mm-hmm. the, obviously the conversation... You, you're hearing more the term white supremacy and white nationalism and Nazi yeah. now more than we have in, in, in decades. As a white Southerner who plays country music, how do you feel when you turn on the news? Just like everybody else does, you I think. You think so? Yeah, just sad. And uh, at the same time, though, you know, I feel like we're having these conversations that we have not had in the past. Um, and I don't know how it is up here, uh, but in, in America— you know, these things have been going on for a long, long, long time. And for every uh, racial injustice that you saw on your television in the 60s, there were a thousand that nobody ever heard about, you know. Now I'm just glad that we're hearing about a larger percentage of the mistakes and the errors that we're making, you know. And I'm glad that we're talking about these things. By writing a song that deals with, you know, uh, uh, gender bias and, and racism, um, I'm trying to tell my own personal story about this, you know, trying to tell people why it's important to me um, to realize that I have a lot of privilege and and I have been uh, afforded things from birth. You know, I used to think when I was when I was younger, I used to think that I had started with nothing, you know, and and made all this happen. Uh, 
Um, and I was grateful, but I was also wrong. I did not start with nothing. Mm-hmm. My version of nothing was nowhere near what some people's nothing is on this planet, you know. And even in my own country, even my own state, even in my own town, I mean, we were all broke, you know, in North Alabama, me and all my friends and all their parents, but we were not all uh, dirt poor like some people really are. Mm-hmm. And and also we had a lot of opportunity, even though we did maybe start out without much, we had a lot of opportunity to get something. Why is that so hard for people to admit? Why is it so hard to say that that maybe things weren't as hard as the narrative you've created in your head? Well, because it undermines what they think of as dignity and and, and their pride, you know, everybody hates a brat. Everybody hates somebody who's been handed everything. And we're programmed to hate people who have been handed everything. So we like to think of ourselves as Mm self-made. You know, we all want to be self-made. Steinbeck said that, didn't he? Didn't he say there are no, uh, there are no poor people in the United States. There are just millionaires in waiting. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, But you know, everybody likes to think, even if they're not rich or don't ever expect to be rich, they like to think that what they have they have because they worked hard and because they made good decisions. Um, and it's really hard for somebody to accept the fact that there are people who have it worse than you because that, that means you have to think there might be people who are better at being you know, a man than I am or better at being a person than I am if they've, if they've started off from a lower point than I've started and, and made it to where I am or made it past where I am. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's this idea, this this this... This, this sort of vague fear that some group of people uh, who have been kept down are going to pass you on the road, you know, uh, to wherever you're going, to happiness or whatever it is that people think they're going to mm-hmm. get. And uh, it, I think it's fueled by commercialism. I think it's fueled by capitalism. capitalism. And, uh, you know, I, I, I also feel like people are, are afraid that nobody's listening to them. And I think white people are afraid of this. Uh, a lot of white men are afraid of this. You know, nobody's listening to me. Um, whose fault is that? You know, and, and people always want to aim at a large group of people and say, okay, well, as long as we all have somebody to hate in common, then then we can be friends. Mm-hmm. I, I can be friends with my asshole neighbor if we both hate a different race or if we both hate a certain politician. And and you know that's that's just making decisions based out of fear. But I, but I still feel like when the well as a, as a southerner, when you mm-hmm. go to the northern parts of the country, not even necessarily to Canada, but when you spend any time in New York, do you feel like people don't quite understand what the South is really like? No, no, it's the same. It's the same. Is oh, that that's so? a myth. Is that so? Because I, I think as a, and I'm guilty of that myth too. You know, because uh-huh. I, I read Flannery O'Connor. You know, and right. I, and I, and I listen to Leonard Skinner, and I think about the South as its, as its own place that perhaps the North doesn't get. Yeah, I think it's a myth. You think so? Um, yeah, I think there's rural and urban. There's definitely a difference between you know uh, New York City and and rural upstate New York. <laughs> yeah. But if you've ever been to rural Michigan, Northern California, I mean Oregon. You know, they have racial problems that are just as bad as any any place in the South has ever had. Look up how Oregon got started, you know. Um, uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a myth. It's, we all have to deal with it. And, yeah, people have – when you're packed into a city and you're living around people who are, you know, immigrants from different countries and people of different, different colors, different ethnicities, you're going to get used to them, you know, and you're going to figure out that, oh, this guy's not so bad, even mm-hmm. if he is whatever color he is. Um, so, yeah, those problems are going to get solved a little bit quicker. But if you grow up insulated by people who look just like you, then you're going to be scared of anything different. That's what happens in rural areas. It doesn't have shit to do with the south or the north. Does a songwriter have a role at a time like this? Um, anybody, everybody has a role. But does a songwriter have a specific role? Or does a songwriter have just as much a role as any other I human? think I have the same role that anybody else has. I think that I just have a, a, a better way to communicate than most people. And do you, have a, do you have an obligation to communicate? I feel like I do. You know, now that I have a daughter, I think. What changed? Um, well, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. And uh, I'm almost 40 years old. And, and I'm in decent shape. But I'm not interested in making the world really better for me. I'm fine. My life is fine, you know. Um, But for her, I I think I'm I'm required to attempt to make things as good as possible. And part of that is to use whatever voice I have to tell people, you know, just love each other. You know, before you fear each other, try loving each other first. If that doesn't work out, you can be scared to death of everybody else. I want to talk to you about Nashville, but I don't want to talk to you about the Nashville sound. Okay. (laughs) 
I want to talk to you because Steve Earle was here um, how long ago? Mitch, like two or three months ago, you think? Yeah, two or three months ago. And that's where he said his, his line of, you know, here's the problem with country music right now is that country yeah. music is hip hop for people who are afraid of black people. Right, right. Which I liked. I liked that line. Did you? I, uh, yeah. I, I didn't like some of the other stuff Steve said in that article, but, you know, Steve can't stop talking once he gets going. He said, well, he says that great line about, like, you know, once you're a pickle, it's hard to go back to being coming a cucumber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> can't get the shit back in the horse, we, can you, we, Steve? We talked a little bit about the history of country music and, and progressive action. You yeah. know, Ralph Stanley, a great bluegrass musician, he was a Democrat who who advocated for Democrats. And yeah. he advocated for Democrats not, you know, back when in the 20s and 30s, in the, in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Do you think that Nashville is shirking a responsibility to speak out? I think that there are a lot of, yeah. If by Nashville you mean people who are who who have a voice in the in the country music, yeah. Industry. And I, I should be clear, Nashville isn't just modern country music, but you know you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but it it is. Yeah, yeah. It's cowardice. You know, if you if you don't if you don't say what you feel, what you believe, um, uh, yeah, then you're you're doing it because you're afraid, and and you know that. That's that's not cool. I mean, those people have large numbers of, of fans, and you know they they have fans that are in rural America, like we were talking about earlier. People that probably need to hear uh, their opinions, and and I know for a fact that there are a lot of country music musicians, famous, you know, huge country stars who feel the same way I do, and the same way Steve Earle does about politics for the most part. But mm-hmm. uh, but they're afraid of alienating um, their fan base, and. Uh, you know, they're probably also being coached by major labels. You well, got to keep in mind that I mean, I own my record label. Nobody is telling me to shut up. Mm-hmm. It's just me and my wife. <laughs> it's just my wife telling me to shut up. Yeah. Thank she's God the one getting out there. the pen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank God she's there for that. But. I think we forget about that. I think we forget that when we speak to artists, in particular rappers, but also country musicians, when we talk to them about the individual things that they say or don't say, we forget that there's a construct, a radio construct, mm-hmm. a label construct, there's a corporation, a corporation there. that is that is keeping them perhaps from saying the things that they want to. Say. Right. So it might not necessarily be their fault. Now, if you look at somebody who has clout with those corporations, somebody who has proven himself or herself, somebody like Tim McGraw. Taylor Swift? Can, yeah, Taylor Swift. You know, you can say things uh, and, and not necessarily be uh, ostracized, you know, by the people that you're working for. Because when you're on a major label, you work for them, you know. And, and uh, I mean, you know, Tim McGraw comes out and says how he feels, and it's great. And, and you know, I'm proud to you know, live close to Tim McGraw. And I think it's great. I think it's a good thing for Nashville, you know. Um, uh, but a lot of those kids who are coming up and just have a hit or two, you know, you, you, you start running your mouth, you might be off of uh, your big major label and you might be back down in the van, you know. Now, for me, I don't care. They can't, you know, they can't do anything to me. But, uh, but yeah. Maybe as we decentralize music, as it becomes less about radio, becomes less about labels, these things will be Less and less important. I think so. I think that's one of the good things that's happening. Um, people are learning that, it, you know, as it gets less expensive to make records and distribute them, people are learning that you can you can go that route. And yeah, you might not sell a million records, but if you're selling a million records and you're making 50 cents a copy, you know, it's, it's I'd rather sell uh, 250,000 and make a few bucks each, you know. Hey, you know what, me too. Yeah, it's a better deal. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm not great at math, but it's a better deal. <laughs> Jason, I want to ask you one last question. Okay. Um, at the end of White Man's World, uh, there is that that glimmer of hope. You yeah. know, at the end of uh, at the end of this song that really is detailing the the a lot of the injustice that you see and that we all see. What what keeps you hopeful? Um, I have a lot of people around me who uh, are good people, and I know that that puts me in a bubble. But it also keeps me from losing faith in humanity um, because I, I have managed to surround myself not with, with yes men or yes women but, but with people who um, act on love first and, and not out of fear. And uh, my family's that way. That part I was very, very lucky uh, to have. You know, my wife's that way, my band, my friends. Um, I don't have a whole lot of friends, but the ones that I have are good, good people and I think that there's a lot of good people out there. You know, I think they're just trying to figure out um, how to get somebody else to listen to them sometimes. Jason, you're going to play another song? Yes. What's I'll it going to be? A couple songs. Let's do, uh, I'll do Anxiety. This is a personal song. It is, yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't deal with uh, clinical, clinical 
Oh boy, what did I just say? I don't deal with clinical. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all deal with. You I know what? I never just, mind. His camera's playing. I never, know. never mind. Let's forget this. I just came up with a whole new disorder. Um, um, I think I watched that last night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah, you yeah, did. At, at Eleven at night. Um, <laughs> I don't deal with clinical anxiety, so I went to my wife because she knows more about that. So I, I wanted to, you know, anxiety's become this kind of catch-all term for stress or neuroses and nerves, whatever. If I if I feel uncomfortable, I'm having anxiety, and that's not always true. There's an actual condition that makes people unable to function. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to discuss that too, and uh, and so my wife helped me write this song, and this uh, this is the only song on any of my albums I've ever co-written with anybody. Um, but just because I wanted to get it right, you know, whatever it takes to get it right. <laughs> 